All right. Well, hello and welcome uh, everybody to today's uh, American Physiologic Society Respiration Section webinar uh, by Dr. Elizabeth Redente. The title of the talk today is Developing Reproducible Small Animal Models to Better Reflect Lung Fibrosis Pathophysiology. Um, I'll be serving as your moderator today. I'm, I'm Chris Waters. Uh, I'm a longtime member of the APS and I'm currently the chair of the respiration section. Uh, in, in today's session, Dr. Redente, who's an associate professor of pediatrics at National Jewish Health, uh, will give insights uh, from both her group's work and, and from the literature on murine models for the study of pulmonary fibrosis, focusing on expanding the use and relevance of the single dose gliomyosin model um, using genetics, uh, age, sex, and repetitive injury to generate a persistent fibrotic disease. Um, before I start, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, uh, CIRAC, uh, for their support of our section, the respiration section's awards and, and social activities. And with us uh, today is uh, Stephanie Rosenbaum from CIRAC, and uh, just give her a, a moment to uh, say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Waters. I'm, as Dr. Waters said, Stephanie, the scientific content manager at uh, MCAN CIRAC. I'm super excited to be here today with Dr. Redente and Dr. Waters, who are both uh, very impactful FlexiVent users for many years now. Um, I guess just a quick little introduction to Emke and Cyrek. If you don't know us already, we work very closely with our collaborators to not only offer uh, in vivo research solutions like the FlexiVent lung function system, the inexposed system, and telemetry, but we also offer complete turnkey um, in vitro and ex vivo research solutions for physiology for pharmacology and tox applications. Uh, so thanks to everyone for being here today. Thanks to Jake and the APS team for setting this up. It's always a pleasure to collaborate with you. And on that note, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Redente. Thanks. Uh, well, I have a, a couple of oh, sorry. notes first. Thank, thanks, Stephanie. Um, so out of respect for the speaker, we ask that you refrain from photo or video captures of the presentation in whole or in part. Uh, this session will be recorded and available for future viewing through a link on the registration website. Um, recording or taking photographs of another person's presentation without their permission is prohibited. Uh, at this time, all attendees except for the speaker are in listen-only mode with video off. As moderator, I'll be happy to raise questions that are entered into the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. You can put your questions into the Q&A at any time. Uh, the session will end at approximately noon Eastern time. And with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Redente, as I mentioned, is an associate professor in the Division of Cell Biology in the Department of Pediatrics at National Jewish Health. Her research focuses on the development of injury and repair of the lung, uh, specifically how it relates to uh, fibroblast cell phenotype in the development of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, Dr. Redente is investigating the resolving process in fibrotic lungs by targeting pro-fibrotic fibroblasts to have a reduced pro-fibrotic phenotype and to undergo apoptosis to allow uh, normal regeneration of the alveolar epithelium. And she's going to tell us uh, a lot more about her work. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Redente. All right. Thank you, Chris, so much for that really kind introduction. And thank you to APS and CIREC as well for sponsoring this workshop today. So we'll go ahead and get, get right into it. Um, so I have no disclosures. So fibrosis is really a common physiological pathological outcome from many diseases that can affect multiple organ systems. And really in the simplest terms, it's defined as the accumulation of excess extracellular matrix. And this is really depicted by the cartoon here on the left side of our screen, where we can see that multiple organs are capable and, and develop fibrosis through various mechanisms, including cirrhosis in the liver, fibrotic kidney disease, fibrosis in the heart, um, as well as in the skin. Scleroderma is an example in that. But today, of course, we're going to be focusing in on the lung. So the initiation and progression of fibrosis can really be triggered and influenced by a wide range of, of different things. And they can include reoccurrent exposure to toxic compounds or irritants, inherited genetic disorders through persistent infections and inflammation, recurrent injury, and then associated with autoimmune disease. But really regardless of these initiating events, 
we believe that epithelial injury leads to immune cell activation and an eventual aberrant wound healing response, which in part is driven by this persistent activation of fibroblasts, which produce extracellular matrix and drive this tissue remodeling. We can look, think about the conceptual view of pathogenesis, and we, we know quite a lot about the basic mechanisms that, that drive the overall progress of this disease. I wanted to just start by looking at some histology. This is gross pathology from a normal lung. Um, here on the far left, we can see that it's quite pink, meaning we have really great blood flow to this organ. We can look at the histology down below where we can zoom in and see the really nice and very delicate architecture of the alveoli, which is facilitating gas exchange. Next, we have an explant from a patient who had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is just one example of a fibrotic um, interstitial lung disease that can occur. There's a really stark contrast between these two images, as I'm sure you can see with the you know, significant remodeling and destruction of normal lung tissue in the IPF patient. When we look at the histology, this is a pentachrome stain. We can see the collagen that's being deposited in the lungs through this yellow and, and teal staining. On the right, we have a schematic of the fibrotic process um, adapted from work by Andy Tager. And you can see that there's multiple steps along the pathway to develop fibrosis. There's an initial injury response, which we think is often targeted to the epithelium, an influx of immune cells and programming of these cells, for example, like macrophages. There's activation of the coagulation cascade so we can prevent leak happening in the lung. There's recruitment um, and expansion of the fibroblast population as well as um, transdifferentiation to myofibroblasts. These cells lay down matrix. And over time, if this becomes a feed forward process, um, matrix continues to be um, deposited, it becomes matured and cross-linked, and eventually we end up with alveolar collapse and aberrant epithelial cell remodeling. And as we think about our preclinical models of fibrosis, um, there are many parts along this, this pathway of disease that we can think about targeting or, or thinking about where our questions lie. And I think that becomes important as we think about which model systems we want to use. So there are many challenges that we face in our preclinical fibrosis research. And we know that our animal models are pivotal for understanding disease, pathogenesis, and for identifying novel therapeutic targets. But we also know that our models cannot often fully reproduce or recapitulate all of the features of human disease. And because of that, numerous compounds um, throughout time has shown efficacy in our animal models but are not effective or do not um, show promising results when they get moved into clinical trials. So we really have to always keep in mind that these animal models are a pretty simple representation of a really complex biological system and a complex um, disease, disease process. And they may only recapitulate a specific aspect of disease. And I, I think that is okay. And we need to really capitalize and, and utilize that um, as we ask our questions. And we'll get into that in a little bit, um, as long as we are keeping that in mind. So therefore, our models must be carefully selected and designed and conducted so that we can bridge this translational gap between the bench, these preclinical models, and the bedside of clinical trials. We really must always be considering if these animal models offer advantages that overcome their minimal representation of human disease. So I want to start our model talk with the really most common and standard model that's found in the literature. And this is the single dose bleomycin model where animals receive a single intratracheal or oropharyngeal injection of bleomycin. So it goes directly to the lungs. We can see, looking at these trichrome images along the top, that the animals develop a really robust fibrotic response by about three weeks. Um, the collagen here is kind of this blue-purple that we can see in the, this uh, dense area that is filled with fibroblasts and, and immune cells. We can quantify the amount of collagen present in the lungs using a hydroxyproline assay. Again, here you can see the significant increase in collagen that's occurred at the peak of this fibrotic response. This model is associated with a significant amount of inflammation, particularly with macrophages and lymphocytes, 
um, which is quantified here looking at total BAL cells. And then as I mentioned, there's also an expansion of our fibroblast populations, which we have quantified here using flow cytometry, um, focusing on the PDGFR alpha positive fibroblast population. And while this is a really nice fibrotic response, um, the key challenge to this model and why it has been criticized in the past is that um, animals or mice undergo a pretty rapid and spontaneous resolution. So depending upon the dose of bleomycin that you've used or the strain of mice, this time course can look a little bit different, but in general, by about six weeks, the lungs are beginning to resolve. Fibrosis is repairing and going away. And by about eight weeks in our hands, the lungs have returned to near normal structure and function. We can see that again, looking at our quantitative data where we see a reduction of our collagen back to normal levels, a reduction in our total amount of inflammation measured by BAL and a return of our fibroblast numbers to normal. And I don't want to be negative about this model because um, it really has given us so much information. We have learned so much about the fibrotic process and it really represents the most cost-effective, the easiest, the fastest and most reproducible model that is currently in the literature. Um, but I think when we use this model, we need to just try to understand what our question is. If we're really interested in the development of fibrosis, there's a perfect window of opportunity to ask those questions. If we're interested in fibrosis resolution questions or repair, again, this model is really ideal to try to understand the repair process. However, when we're thinking about therapeutic intervention with this model, our window of intervening just during this peak of collagen response or when the tissue is fibrotic actually becomes quite narrow. So those studies become challenging. This was really captured very nicely by a recent um, paper by Martin Kolb in the ERJ in 2020. He conducted a meta-analysis of the bleomycin model um, of fibrosis and therapeutic intervention strategies. And what he found was that between 1980 and 2006, more than 95% of studies, therapeutic studies, use a preventative treatment strategy, meaning they treated with their compound prior to animals receiving bleomycin. So they were really looking at prevention of fibrosis development. And less than 5% of studies treated during this therapeutic phase, meaning around the two to three week time point when animals were fibrotic. This has begun to really change in the literature, which I think is good. Um, so between 2008 and 2019, 74% um, of the publications with bleomycin investigated a potential therapeutic. So we can see this huge increase in um, the number of potential therapies that are being studied in this model. But now our, our numbers have started to shift. So now 61% were solely preventative studies, but we've seen an increase in the number of therapeutic studies to almost 30 or almost 23%. Um, and in a small proportion, about 15% studies um, examined both a preventative and a therapeutic strategy with their compounds. But only about 16% characterized the inflammation during the early inflammatory phase. So there's been a big shift from less than 5% to almost 40% of studies that are evalu evaluating our drugs in the therapeutic window, which I think is really important and will help the translation of our preclinical studies into the clinic. However, there's another gap that he found in the literature when he looked at 145 IPF clinical trials that investigated 93 compounds or combinations, only about 27% of these um, trials had any preclinical data on the bleomycin model available in PubMed. So this really just calls into focus that as researchers were using this these models to think about our questions, to understand the mechanisms of fibrosis and potentially to think about therapeutics. But um, many times in industry, they're not using the same standards or the same models um, as they're moving forward with their um, drug development. And so we really need to have good alignment um, if we're gonna see success in the clinic. So I, I think what this sets the stage for after looking at the single dose model, and thinking about this meta-analysis is this question of, can we do better? And what do we really need from our preclinical models to do better? And I think this is just a short list of things we can think about. We really want characteristics that rep rep replicate human disease. 
So those that maybe have appropriate genetic changes, association with an aging component or accounting for sex differences, models that are persistent and progressive. It would be fantastic to have models that have histological and cellular changes that um, are replicated in patient tissue, for example, honeycombing, the presence of fibroblastic foci or senescent cells, relevance to other ILDs. It's not just IPF that's out there, but looking at rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD, sarcoidosis, et cetera. Um, integration of clinically relevant outcomes, looking at lung physiology, looking at small animal imaging or biomarkers. And I think an area that um, definitely could use some extra work is the idea of susceptibility to exacerbations. For our preclinical models, we want them to be cost-effective and have accelerated results, of course. And hopefully this will lead to identifiable therapeutic targets that better translate from our preclinical models into patients. So from here, we're gonna move on to looking at data, some of the data is from our laboratory group, um, some from the literature. And I really want to walk through just some examples of these different characteristics, looking at models of genetic changes, looking at models um, and data associated with aging and with sex differences, models of persistent and progressive disease, um, as well as the integration of clinically relevant outcomes comes throughout. So we're gonna start with asking questions about genetics. And the first is the opportunity to use relevant genetic mutations to target specific aspects of the disease. This data comes from David Schwartz's group. It's an example of MUC5B overexpression in airway epithelial cells. So the gain of function minor T allele variant in, MUC5, in the MUC5B promoter is the major risk factor for the development of IPF. So therefore having a genetic model where we can mimic this overexpression of MUC5B in the airway cells becomes incredibly relevant as we think about translation to human disease. And in these animals, they develop a robust fibrotic response. This is looking at hydroxyproline and collagen. And when we look at the histology, you can see that it looks quite different than that three-week bleomycin data I showed you where we start to see the formation of aberrant airway epithelium then these cells are MUC5B positive, again, reflective of the histology and pathology that is seen in patients. Additionally, with this model, um, the group sees the expansion of these KRT8 positive transitional epithelial cells that have, again, been shown to be prevalent in IPF lungs, and these are surrounding areas that are MUC5B positive. So using a mutation that is found in patients, we can start to ask questions about the role of, of this gene in the development of the fibrotic process. There's many other genetic models that target uh, mutations associated with fibrosis. For example, TERP mutations, telomerase mutations, mutations in SPC. Um, those can all be found in the literature. In our laboratory, we've used genetics a little bit different way. We've asked questions, proof of concept questions using genetic models to target a very specific aspect of disease. So we have a genetic model where we can delete FAST, specifically in collagen producing fibroblasts. This prevents the fibroblasts from undergoing extrinsic apoptosis. So we can keep this population alive and we wanted to understand if we could prevent spontaneous resolution from occurring. So um, we'll start here on the right, the data, um, these are just immunofluorescent images where our fibroblasts are, have a GFP reporter so we can follow them. So this is call 1A1 GFP, so our fibroblasts are here in green. When we have fast sufficient mice, so we cross the call 1A1 CRE ERT2, so this is a tamoxifen inducible model to fast flux mice. We treat with corn oil, our fibroblasts maintain fast, these cells are, under able, are able to undergo apoptosis, so they're apoptosis sensitive. However, if we give tamoxifen to these mice, they delete fast, and now these cells are apoptosis resistant. We can see the effect of this genetic deletion here by looking at fibroblast numbers. This is six weeks after a single dose of bleomycin, so we would expect that fibrosis would be resolving, 
And in our mice that receive corn oil that are fast sufficient, we see a reduction in their fibroblast numbers, but they are maintained at a high level when they become apoptotic resistance. resistant. We also see changes in the overall course of our disease. If we look at um, mice with fast present in their fibroblasts in these open circles, this is looking at collagen content in the lung, we can see um, the rapid increase in collagen reflective of the fibrotic disease process. And then this resolution that we've talked about, which we see in wild type mice, compared to mice where we've deleted fast, we see sustained collagen in the lung and, and disease. And this is again reflective in our histology. This is looking at six weeks, the same six week time point. Um, these are mice where fibroblasts have undergone apoptosis and resolution is occurring. There are very few collagen positive cells left in the lung. Um, in comparison, when FAST is deleted and this population is sustained, we still see the presence of this robust population. So this is just an example of how we can genetically manipulate um, a specific, specific cell type or specific gene, um, which allowed us to ask a very unique question about the course of disease. And so Again, as we have access with our animals to different Cree drivers and different genetic mutations, we're able to really delve into the biology um, of specific fibrotic processes. Next, I wanna talk about um, sex and age considerations in our model. Um, we know that fibrosis is a disease of aging. We know that there's a greater prevalence in males compared to females. And so that becomes a really important component um, for us to study. And it's something that the NIH also cares a lot about. And so we should always be considering both age and sex when possible um, in our studies. So we published in, in 2011, we, we did some studies looking at both age and sex. So female mice, um, and male mice at young, treated between eight and 10 weeks of age, and then aged mice treated over a year old. And this is, again, is with the single dose bleomycin model. Um, the data showing here is looking at collagen content in the lung, lung physiology using the flex event, measuring static compliance, and then TGF beta present in the BIL. And we can see with the female mice, which are shown in the red bars, that young mice compared to old mice, old female mice, get a robust fibrotic response, but it, it wasn't different um, as the animals aged. Compared to the male mice, even the young male mice had, a, had an increase in their fibrotic response compared to the females. And then in the aged male mice, this was um, accentuated even more. And these animals were uh, had increased sensitivity and a more robust fibrotic response when looking at the collagen as well as the histology. And this was also apparent and tracked very nicely in our physiology measurements of compliance where we saw a greater significant reduction in compliance in our male mice and our aged male mice compared to our females, as well as um, a more robust and increase in TGF beta signaling this profibrotic cytokine. Really beautiful studies by Louise Hecker and Victor Thanicle's group also looked at aged male mice and they did their studies a little bit differently. They looked at a three week time point and then allowed the animals to, um, to, to progress for an additional two months to look at disease persistence. And so they found that in young mice, after a single dose of bleomycin, they develop a robust response at three weeks, but began to see resolution of the disease by two months. However, this was significantly impaired in the aged male mice. So not only are aged male mice more susceptible and they get a, a more robust fibrotic response, they also don't undergo um, spontaneous resolution within the same time course. And work by um, Mauricio Rojas and Anna Mora um, really have started to look at, at um, stress response markers in these aging animal models and show that there's increased ER stress markers in these cells as well. So again, um, not just looking at increased persistence in this disease, but other markers that are associated with IPF, including ER stress, um, become apparent as the animals are aged. Another model where we see age and sex differences is um, in a model of rheumatoid arthritis and interstitial lung disease. This is an SKG mouse. So this is an example of a gene by environment interaction where these both things are necessary for disease formation. 
These animals have a spontaneous mutation, point mutation in ZAP70, and only upon exposure to a beta-glucan, we use Zinazan for these experiments, do they develop arthritis, and only a subpopulation of these animals then go on to develop a fibrotic or um, interstitial lung disease. On the left, these are just pictures of what the arthritis looks like in these animals. Saline mice are saline treated mice are on the top and animals receiving zymazan are on the bottom. You can see the swelling in the joints and in the digits that is um, indicative of the arthritis. And then we can score these over time. But this is a really great example of a sex difference. So this is in young, young animals, but we can see that the arthritis is much more robust in females compared to males. So there is a sex difference in arthritis, but there's also a sex difference and an age difference when we look at the lung disease. In young female mice, 70% um, develop a very mild um, kind of inflammatory and subfibrotic histology, which is depicted here in this picroserious red image where the collagen is, is red. And about 30% develop a NSIP-like fibrotic lung disease. However, in aged males, so these are males over a year old, they develop a progressive and fatal fibrotic disease. So there's differences in arthritis in this model based on sex, and there's differences in the percentage and type of fibrosis seen in the, in the lungs, again, based on sex and age. This is um, just some additional data from this model. And what we really like about this model and what keeps it exciting for us is that these young female mice really mimic IL the ILD disease frequency observed in patients with ILD. So 10% or more of patients with RA end up with a NSIP or UIP um, fibrotic lung pattern and lung disease. And so it's really fantastic to have a model where only a proportion of the animals have end up with lung disease. So we can see a proportion have decreased static compliance and the same proportion has this increase in um, hydroxyproline. Um, additionally, there's differences in arthritis prevalence. So not only the severity, but in terms of how the prevalence of the animals that get disease that is differentiated between both the young females and young males. And this is, again, just to reiterate that this is a model where we're mimicking the same types of sex differences and age differences and disease prevalence that is seen in patient populations. All right, we're gonna move on to talk about examples of persistent disease. For us, this has been um, a long time goal trying to, to take the single dose bleomycin model where we get um, this rapid resolution to develop it into a model where we have sustained disease. So Amber DeGreesey um, in 2010, as part of Tim Blackwell's group, published a really beautiful paper using eight, eight doses of bleomycin, so eight installations to develop um, this robust fibrotic response. And we've since modified um, that down to three installations, um, partly for time and for ease um, in working with the animals. And so the animals receive three biweekly installations of bleomycin. And then here I'm just showing some time course data so we can look at the development of fibrosis over time. We've taken these animals out six months after the last installation. And we can see that there's a significant increase in sustained amount of TGF beta present in the BIL. We can look at collagen levels measured again by hydroxyproline. Again, this is sustained um, and significantly increased out six months over time. And our fibroblast numbers have also expanded and remained increased over time. On the right are representative trichrome images and immunofluorescent images from a lung taken 24 weeks after bleomycin. You can see the robust amount of collagen and the fibrotic response here with the teal blue staining. And below with alpha smooth muscle actin staining in green, collagen 1A1 in red, um, you can see that these areas of fibrosis are really dominated by these fibroblast populations. With this model, and we wanted to try to characterize it as well with um, you know, clinically relevant outcomes. So we were able to look at oxygen saturation in these animals where we see a significant reduction as would be expected based on the amount of disease in the lungs. 
Again, looking at physiology, measuring our static compliance is significantly reduced in our fibrotic mice compared to our controls. And then we're very fortunate to have access to a, a micro CT. So we're able to longitudinally um, analyze our mice over time with the CT with high resolution images. Um, the first images are cross-sectional um, planes. Um, this is a saline lung. I've kind of outlined the lung area for you in red. The dark is airspace. Um, these white occlusions in the control are really the vasculature. This is blood. And we can see the vasculature um, in this 3D reconstruction here on the far right. This bottom picture is after... Um, mice received repetitively a mice, and again at 24 weeks. So I've outlined the lung shape for you. Now much of this opacity is actually the fibrotic disease. And we know that um, not only because we can compare much of our CT data to um, CT scans from patients, um, but also because we have all of our um, other outcomes from these animals, histology, um, biochemical assays like hydroxyproline to know that it is indeed fibrosis. Um, but when we take this and do our 3D reconstruction, we can see the significant amount of um, morphologic changes that are apparent in the lung um, and really this aberrant remodeling. The other thing that's left us very excited about this model is that it is also developing histological features of ILD, including um, the formation of simple KRT positive cysts. Um, that are forming on the left is an example from an IPF lung where we can see these cysts forming. They are filled with these KRT8 positive transitional epithelial cells. And when we look at a single dose bleomycin, this is three weeks, so the peak of that fibrotic response and stain for airway cells with CCSP in purple, these transitional epithelial cells, KRT8 um, in green, we can see a few of these cells present, but they're really not very dominant. Um, and aren't really forming um, defined structures. However, after repetitive bleomycin, again, this is at 24 weeks, we now see a robust expansion of these KRT8 positive cells, um, and they're beginning to form these simple cyst structures. Additionally, these cystic structures um, are expressing MUC5B. So with this idea of repetitive injury, not only are we getting sustained fibrotic disease, sustained fibrosis, we're beginning to see histological changes um, and protein expression changes that are more reflective of what are seen in a fibrotic patient lung. Additionally, this is work that was completed and published recently by Joseph Cooley, who was a fellow in the laboratory. Um, and he was really interested in, in understanding the fibroblast phenotype. And when we do a lot of in vitro studies, and when he pulled the fibroblasts out of the lungs, to grow them in culture after repetitive injury, um, he, he discovered that they had undergone replic replicative senescence. And so we were not able to pa passage them in culture past passage two, and they stain quite nicely for um, senescence associated beta-galactosidase compared to fibroblasts that were coming out of the lungs just three weeks after bleomycin. There was also gene expression pattern changes associated with senescence um, in the repetitive bleomycin, which we can see here, on the right compared to um, the pattern of gene changes associated after single dose bleomycin. So the other thing about this model that we like to think about and consider is that it really has an aging component post built in post-injury. So mice receive their repetitive injury as young adults between eight and 14 weeks of age. And then their fibrosis is really developing and persisting throughout their adult life. Again, ending in um, these histological changes and physiological changes that are, are more reflective than the single dose model um, of patient lungs. And finally, the other thing that we did with this model is we wanted to look at, at the serum for a proteomic signature to see if we were seeing changes that were reflective of um, what has been published for IPF patients. And so Susan Mathay and David Schwartz published a really nice paper um, in the Blue Journal in 2022, looking at proteomic signatures of patients with IPF and patients with preclinical um, IPF that they were able to track um, the progression of their disease. So we also looked at the proteomic signature in our animals, mice that received repetitive saline are here in blue, um, and then mice that received repetitive blue mice are here in green. And you can see just looking at a PCA plot, essentially that the 
overall proteomic signature between these two groups is quite different. Um, but we had a lot of overlap with, with the patient signals that uh, Susan was able to find in, in her, publish in her paper. And so um, 11 of our proteins correlated to 25 of the, I, their direct IPF related proteins. And we had a, an additional 11 proteins that correlated um, to their preclinical pulmonary fibrosis protein. And one I'd really like to highlight is fibulin-1, um, where in patients, there's been shown to be a correlation between increased fibulin-1 in the serum that correlates with disease progression. So it's really fantastic to have a model where we're seeing multiple um, ways to use this model and multiple correlations to, to human disease. And the last model that I want to briefly talk about is another model of persistent disease. And this is really the relevance of occupational silica exposure. And we know that our veterans are at risk, increased risk for fibrosis and other um, airway-centric diseases through their exposure to silicate-enriched desert dust and, and burn pit exposure. Additionally, there's been a global surge in severe silicosis that has been recognized in workers um, dealing with fabricated um, and engineered stone, for example, granite countertops. And there's also been a surge in progressive fibrosis among coal miners um, who have more than 25 years of mining. And I'd like to call your attention to this graph on the bottom right, where from 2000 here, we can see this increased prevalence um, of fibrosis associated with coal mining. Um, so this is really a big concern and an area of patient care that we need to be thinking about. So we can mimic this quite well in our animal models. We give a single installation of crystalline silica into the lungs. Um, again, this is just time course data looking at the development of these um, small granulomas around week four. Again, this is trichrome, so the collagen deposition is in blue. And um, these granuloma lesions are filled with fibroblasts as well as immune cells like macrophages. Um, but they just continue to expand over time. So the lesions just get bigger. This is an example, eight weeks and then 24 weeks. And then even a year later, the lungs are severely fibrotic. We can use polarized microscopy to observe where the silica is located. Um, it shows up white and it's with well within these fibrotic um, lesions. So we're able to quantify our fibroblasts over time. You can see that they're just significantly continuing to increase as the fibrosis develops similarly increases in collagen over time um, and using our micro CT analysis, monitoring the same animals longitudinally, we're able to track this non-aerated lung volume. So the opacity and the disease of the lung showing that that also is increasing over time. And so as we've talked about these multiple models, um, we've touched on genetics and how we can utilize different types of genetic models to answer very specific questions about disease pathogenesis. We've looked at examples of age and sex differences, both with the single dose bleomycin, but also in a model of RAILD, where we see differences in multiple disease compartments, including joints and the lung. And then we've talked through two different models of persistent fibrosis um, after repetitive injury and then after occupational exposure. Um, but what we talked about coming back to this idea at the beginning with Martin Kolb's work and the idea of the appropriate therapeutic window, I just wanted to show two examples of where we've used our persistent fibrotic models for therapeutic intervention studies. So the first is after, um, the, after established fibrosis using the repetitive bleomycin model. Um, so this is work published by Joe Cooley um, earlier, or last year, I guess. Um, so we initiated fibrosis um, between zero and six weeks, so three doses of bleomycin, we allowed the mice to develop fibrosis. So they had established disease. And we can see that here looking at the CT scans, the fibrotic area is overlaid in red. Um, so this is the time point where we began our therapeutic intervention. So all the animals were fibrotic. Um, and we know from our time course studies that the fibrosis is going to persist. So we're not dealing with that very short and rapid resolution time period that would occur with the single dose bleomycin. We treated with a drug daily for four weeks. Um, the drug we're using was ABT-263. The goal of these studies was try to target the fibroblast to undergo apoptosis. And then we analyzed our animals um, four weeks later at week 14. 
and we could see a significant reduction in the overall fibrosis after treatment compared to mice that received vehicle. And this is all the quantitation here on the right. So we saw a reduction in fibroblast numbers, which was part of our hypothesis with this drug, a significant reduction in collagen, um, a re starting to return to normal of the non-aerated lung volume with our micro CT analysis and a decrease in our disease score from the, path from the histopathology. Additionally, we repeated these studies in a second model looking at silica. So again, we initiated fibrosis. We waited four weeks for disease to become established. Here are representative micro CT scans showing again, overlaid in red, the amount of fibrosis that was present when we started our therapeutic intervention. Again, mice received ABT 263 daily for four weeks. And then we had an endpoint analysis at eight weeks. Similar to the previous slide and the previous model, we were able to show a significant reduction in disease, our number of fibroblasts, reduction in collagen, and a restoration of non-aerated lung volume with this therapeutic strategy. And so this is less important about what drug we were treating with or the mechanism of action, but more to show the example of how we could use these non-resolving models to really uh, weight to treat mice with really established disease, have the confidence of knowing that disease is going to progress or persist on its own um, before intervening, and then really able to look at the idea of um, initiating a fibrosis resolution. So in conclusion, the single-dose bleomycin model of lung fibrosis really does represent the most cost-effective, easiest, fastest, most reproducible, and most extensively studied animal model fibrosis. So it absolutely has its place, but there are disadvantages and it's minimal representation of human disease, namely the histopathology and its ability to resolve on its own. But, you know, we do need to remember and recognize that this model has been used to develop the two therapies that are currently used for IPF and perfenidone. So it absolutely has its place. But I do think it's important as we continue to move forward to think about the incorporation of genetic models that replicate specific disease aspects, thinking about aging and sex differences in our models, the incorporation of repetitive injury and persistent models for therapeutic studies, including occupational exposure. Um, though it seems painful, especially for things involving therapeutics, I think we really should set a standard of using two to three models and really trying to include clinically relevant endpoints like lung function, measurements with the flex event, oxygen saturation, micro CT if possible, and looking at biomarkers. And further, you know, with the advancement of omics and cutting in technology like spatial transcriptomics, it will be really important to start to integrate those kinds of features as well um, so that we can improve our clinical translation. And finally, um, there is a lot of space to, for further development to other relevant models, including ferrets and pigs and rats. And that has been slow due to the cost of these animals, as well as you know, reduced reagents, or it's much harder to create all of these um, genetic strains that we depend upon, but um, most certainly an area that, that will lead to better translation to human disease. So again, our goal with our preclinical models is really to understand what we're getting out of our mirroring studies, what are the advantages, what are the limitations, and how can we best apply them to understand human fibrosis. And we've talked through a lot of these different aspects, um, but again, I just wanted to reiterate at the end here that there's multiple points that we can think about understanding the mechanism or trying to think about intervention in this pathway of developing a disease like pulmonary fibrosis. And so taking the tools that we've talked about today, um, whether it be genetics, age, sex differences, repetitive injury, targeting specific cell types, um, there is an opportunity with all of these tools, I think we're quite fortunate to think about all the different points along this pathway um, where we can think about intervening in the development of therapeutics. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the people in our group um, and who I closely collaborate with, as well as the cores we work with, um, especially a shout out to Katie Kopp, who is our animal physiology core um, leader and, and conducts a lot of the flux event and micro CT studies that we do. 
Um, and then again, thank you to APS and to CIREC for hosting this um, webinar. And from there, I will be happy to answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, we have time for uh, questions. And, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning, if you can put your questions in the Q&A thing rather than the chat, we'll try to address those. And uh, Elizabeth, I will uh, i don't know if you can read them or if you want me to go ahead and read them. Um, let's see. I'll start with the first one and then you can let me know what you want to do. Uh, okay. The first one is from, uh, it says, I, I believe a functional testing method like FlexEvent was used did you also evaluate expiratory capacity, FEV1 over FEC, in the repeated bleomycin models? Um, yeah, so when we did the flex event um, studies, yeah, we looked at PV curves um, and we do have the other measurements. Um, we definitely see differences in PV curves. Um, I think that honestly, the challenge with the animal models and and PV curves and things like that is they don't have as big of shifts as what's seen in, in patients. And so sometimes it's a little challenging when you go to, to publish or you're presenting and people are expecting these massive changes. So we tend to, to stick with, with compliance. It seems to be the most repeatable outcome. And there were a couple of questions related to your method. So I'll try to summarize those if I can. So one of them is about um, the the dose of uh, bleomycin that you use for the three biweekly injections, and then one was about how the silica was administered. Okay, great. Yeah, dose of bleomycin, that's a great and really important question. And first, it's really important to, um, with bleomycin is to, it, it's going to vary from paper to paper and lab to lab. You'll see there's a lot of variation in the literature, and that's because the activity of the bleomycin varies from manufacturer and pharmacy and if you buy it from Sigma or not. And also in the strain of mice, how sensitive they are, um, which doesn't answer your question, but it just means that what we do is for every new lot of bleomycin we get, we actually titrate a dose so that we're getting a robust fibrotic response without high mortality. And we tend to use about half the dose of our single bleomycin dose for our repetitive studies. So if we're using two units per kilogram for single dose, we use one unit for our repetitive studies. But again, we do spend time titrating um, as we, we work within these models. Uh, the silica is given intratracheally okay. as well. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to filter through some of these because we're getting a lot of questions now. Um, uh, any, uh, any comment on how we can use uh, adenoviral TGF-beta and murine models to complement the pulmonary fibrosis mechanisms and therapeutics along with aged mice? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I it's remiss of me to have not put in TGF-beta adenoviral data, actually. Um, so thank you for bringing that up as another really good model um, of fibrosis development. In our hands, it's um, you get a really robust fibrotic response, but there is also eventual resolution as, you know, the adenovirus is cleared and there's able to be repair. Um, but I do think it's, it's also a really valid and important model. Um, and yeah, especially with aging a, as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So let's see, that's, there's a couple of questions related to that. I'm just seeing if there, if we should for, go forward on that or just go to another topic. Um, support for the single bleomycin-induced in, injury. Uh, are there any compounds in your experience that are effective at resolving the fibrosis in mice? With single dose? Yeah. <laughs> so there's probably think, lots that have been studied. There's a lot. Uh, yeah, we kind of try to think about it as accelerating the natural resolution process instead of, you know, really getting rid of the fibrosis because we, it's going to get better by itself. Um, but I, I mean, we've done studies in our hands and profenadone and then tetanib all work to do that. Um, but the literature is, is really full of examples where um, it's been successful in fibrosis resolution is successful in the, in the mice with the single dose bleomycin. And I think that's the challenge is it's then not successful in the clinic. Um, someone asks, what's the mortality rate of the tribleomycin model? Yeah. So again, we've 
worked really carefully to titrate our doses so we have less than 10% mortality. Um, so uh, someone asks, I'm also interested in what you think about functional testing methods such as FlexEvent to evaluate lung fibrosis models. Uh, what do you find in your silicosis model? What does the micro CT tell you on lung volumes upon silicosis with and without treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, similar to what others have seen in the literature with, especially with silica, um, there's, it seems that there's compensation of the airways and airway enlargement and also lung tissue enlargement to, to compensate for the area that becomes fibrotic. And so in that model, we don't actually see as big of drops in our compliance or flex event because there's this compensation that happens. And with the CT, micro CT, when you look at aerated lung volume, we see the same thing. There's actually this increase in aerated lung volume. And that's why we've really tried to move to be able to analyze the non-aerated vo lung volume, this occluded tissue. Um, Cause I was frustrated. I, you know, you can do all the scans, you can see the fibrosis, but the values aren't changing. Um, and so we wanted to be able to track actually fibrotic area of the lung. Um, so I do think with everything, that's what's really nice about our animal models is we can use multiple types of outcomes. So maybe flex event isn't giving the most dramatic response, but we can still look at histology. We can measure collagen and, and other outcomes. Yeah, it's probably a little bit like acute lung injury where you can't just look at one measure. You've you got look to at look one at thing, yeah, yeah. Things and, and... But the lung is pretty good at uh, <laughs> keep, keeping functional, right? So there can right. be some compensation expansion. I'm, I'm just going to make a comment because I'm seeing a lot of questions about the dosing. And mm. I was glad to hear you make that comment about it. It really does depend upon your source and the and the um the, the lot and and uh, all of these other things that are highly variable in, in our hands as well that mm -hmm. uh, so I think we all need to appreciate. Um, so uh, there's a question here about, um, have you ever measured blood gases in your mice? Do the animals become hypoxic or hypercapnic? Um, we haven't measured blood gas directly. We just have like a pulse oximeter is as far as we've gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do they, do you see appreciable, um, hypoxia? Yeah. And there's significant decreases in oxygen saturation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a general question about, um, which is closer to human IPF. Do you think the repetitive bleomycin or the silica? It's a really good question. Um, so I think we have to be really careful with these types of questions. So silica is going to mimic an occupational silica exposure very directly, which is not by definition idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and I think as we learn more about fibrotic lung diseases, IPF is only a small fraction of these ILDs that are seen. And so, um, you know, that there's this link in the literature where people say bleomycin is the same as IPF. And, and we know that's that's not true. And so I think it's more important to think about these as modeling ILDs and not necessarily just IPF or just an occupational exposure. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to filter through because there's a lot of questions and some of them are similar. So I wanna make sure that we get to some newer questions. Um, can, can we assess non-invasive lung function tests, for example, total body plethysmography, and is there a need to develop this further to isolate resting breathing profiles? Yeah, we haven't, in our lab, we haven't done plasmography, um, but I do think it's valid. And um, I mean, I'm a big fan of anything that can be done longitudinally, um, especially as we think about therapeutic studies, because it's really nice to know that all of your animals are fibrotic or have reduced oxygen before you start your, your treatment and to follow an animal over time and collect multiple data points. So um, I think it's important to think about all the opportunities for longitudinal outcomes. So, um, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm editing a little bit. A lot of people are saying how great a talk it was oh, and okay. excellent talk, but I'm, <laughs> I'm editing a little. Um, there's a question about how did you measure uniform distribution of the bleomycin or the silica after administration? Yeah, 
again, a really great question. So um, we found that the uniformity of the distribution comes down to the installation technique. And so it's really important to have a, a good initial installation in, into the lungs. So, um, you know, we strive to instill before the bifurcation so that we get good distribution um, in both lungs. Um, and to be honest, when as we develop these models, we spend a lot of time testing the installations or as we're training people to make sure that um, when we instill, we get even distribution. It's another great thing about looking at the micro CT, having that capacity is that we can scan our animals and make sure there is fibrosis pretty evenly distributed. But it for us, it comes down to installation, mm -hmm. which just takes practice, a lot of practice. Um, hold on, my screen and the, the questions are jumping because they <laughs> add more. So um, uh, there's a question about what are your thoughts on bleomycin delivered subcutaneously with os osmotic pumps? Do you think this is a way to make a similar model of the repetitive dose? Yeah, I think that there's a lot we can learn from sub-Q delivery. And I think then we end up with other relevant models too, like, like scleroderma where there's you know, skin involvement and sarcoidosis and things like that. Um, it just hasn't been a method that we have done. Um, I think it becomes a little bit more complicated because you need to do surgery. And so you need to have the appropriate vet staff. So it may not be something that everyone that's feasible for all labs, but I think it's important not to uh, discount the sub Q delivery. Uh, here's another question about, um, uh, the models. Uh, do you have any recommendations for an animal model of children's ILD, uh, in particular beyond incorporating the known genetic um, mutations caused causing childlike um, um, uh, disease? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I so I can see the, some of the questions you're reading. Okay. So thank you yeah, hard, for that excellent question. to follow. Question. There's so many. <laughs> I don't really probably really have an answer for you, but um, but I. Again, I, I think what I, maybe what I'd like people to think about from this talk is just, there's a lot of ways we can think about these models and we shouldn't limit ourselves to thinking about just single dose bleo, but to really start to build opportunities to study um, really the things we are we're, are interested, like, like she's asking about other genetic mutations that affect child um, pediatric ILDs, so. So I don't have an answer for you, but um, it's important. <laughs> and by the way, if you if you see a question on there that you think is uh, relevant and you'd like to answer, please go ahead and and um, point it out. I'm just trying to I'm trying to cover some ground here because we're going to run out of time in a minute or two, and there are going to be a lot of unanswered questions. I think so. Um, uh, uh, here's another question: Have you have you tried to use the flex event to administer or nebulize the bleomycin to mice? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And I know that's um, newer technology coming out of CYREC. Uh, we have not done that. Um, and it might be a question better suited for Stephanie, actually. But um, I think that CYREC is really working on that technology. Um, that would be a great way to get um, really nice distribution and probably really deep in the lungs as well. Um, let me see. Some of these are similar questions that I'm looking at now. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of uh, in vitro models in studying ILD and or IPF? We had a little pre-discussion about this earlier, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think just like with the single dose bleomycin model, there is a an appropriate place for all of these steps from in vitro cell culture of isolated populations to the more complex of organoids or precision cut lung slices. Um, you know, we just have to be careful about what questions we're asking and what can be answered using those systems. And, but, you know, when you're looking at mechanism and taking a reductionist approach, we, we can't do it without those things. So they're incredibly important and we use them in our lab too. So this is a, a question I think a lot of people may have on their minds, and I think the I think the answer is yes. Do you have uh, RNA seq data from your models? Yes, some of it is is published, and some of it we're working on manuscripts 
to get out, but, um, mm -hmm, yep. Some of it's definitely available. And, you know, the fantastic thing that we found with our sequencing, both bulk and single cell is that when we've compared our data to other groups in the literature, um, Dean Shepard, Naftali Kaminsky's group, um, both with human and IPF, there's a lot of overlap. We really see very similar cell populations, very similar gene changes. Um, and so it's actually quite encouraging that, um, you know, there's a lot of variability with these animal models lab to lab, but with the sequencing there, there seems to be quite a bit of consensus between the lab groups. So I'd encourage you to look at the literature and, and the, the geo databases, um, cause there's a lot of resources there. I'm, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned early in your, in your, uh, presentation, that there was there were only a few or twenty five percent of the of the um, things that the drugs that went to clinical trial had come from a preclinical bleomycin model, and uh, so what do you think are the models that the the companies are using uh, instead of bleomycin? Well, they I think they either didn't publish their right. bleomycin model. Um, okay. Okay. I think that's probably the main outcome, but also their companies are doing a lot of work with the PCLSs and, mm -hmm. and cell culture. It's one with the PCLS, you can have access to human tissue, uh, which is a definite advantage. Um, and overall, they're much faster, especially for compound screening, um, faster and more cost-effective. Right. Right. And it's human tissue usually when they're- and It's human tissue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have passed uh, the noon time uh, hour. We're into the noon hour. Um, there's certainly a lot of questions on here. I don't know if there's a way for those questions to be sent to Elizabeth so that she can maybe reply. Um, but I do want to take a moment and just uh, thank you again. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. Lots of interest, obviously, with the number of attendees and the number of uh, questions. Uh, and thanks to CYREC for their support for this. And thanks for the APS and Jake White for uh, for helping us organize this. And and thank you all, all of all of the um, um, people who have uh, attended. We really appreciate it. Uh, there is a short survey about the session uh, that when you sign off I, or start to sign off that you can answer. And we'd really appreciate if you would do that so we can uh, think about other webinars that we can program in the future. So again, thank you all very much. Um, and thank you, Dr. Ridente. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's great.